Welcome uh, to today's webinar, Public Health Careers in the Age of COVID-19. Before we get started, I have just a few items that I want to mention, a few housekeeping things. First, um, we will be recording this event uh, and there will be time for questions at the end. Um, you can ask a question by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll be um, checking um, questions throughout the webinar and um, we'll be able to um, ask those to our panelists uh, at the end um, of the session. Thank you for being here today. My name is Anjali Deshpande. I'm a clinical associate professor of epidemiology here at the University of Iowa College of Public Health. Today we have assembled a panel of College of Public Health alumni with differing degrees and career paths. We hope to provide a view into not only different public health career roles, but also ways that our alumni are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in their workplaces. As it turns out, it's homecoming week here at the University of Iowa. And so it's very fitting that we welcome our alumni panelists back to Iowa to be here with us virtually today. Um, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna begin our conversation um, and I'd like to ask each of the panelists to please introduce yourself and then discuss your career path since graduation um, and how your public health training has prepared you. So just kind of a brief um, overview of, of when you graduated, what you've been doing um, in the time since then, and, and your overall thinking about how your public health training has prepared you. So why don't we start uh, with Taylor Gray. Taylor received um, her MPH in Community and Behavioral Health in 2016. Taylor. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the first, I mean, it's great to be here. Thanks for, thank you for that. Um, and yeah, so I graduated in 2016. Um, a little bit about uh, my career path, I guess. Yeah, I um, and through the Community and Behavioral Health Program, uh, and my background is actually in psychology uh, before that. So the program, which is kind of a different direction at times, uh, thinking about it, because when we think of psychology, that's often, you know, an individual, interpersonal level. Um, so the program really helped with being able to support you know, my learning and how to expand that to community and, and other social ecological levels, which was really wonderful, um, as well as being able to, you know, work on uh, strategically developing programs, um, doing program evaluation and just working with communities and communication with communities. So um, really, I mean, the program was wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, Taylor, as, tell us where you are now. Yeah, yep, yeah, sorry about that. No, that's uh, fine. So right now I am at uh, Olmsted County Public Health, located our home, you know, lo uh, within the county, we're located out of Rochester, Minnesota. Um, so I am a community health specialist and my focus area is mental health and substance use. So very, uh, very applicable to my, my area. Um, so that is um, what I am, or where I am now. Before that, I did quite a bit of work in um, disability rights, uh, mm -hmm. working at a nonprofit in Iowa. So I've kind of jumped states um, and am, uh, you know, transitioning in public health career, but um, every part, I've, I've enjoyed, so. Um, yeah, there's... <laughs> Excellent, we're gonna hear more about uh, what you're doing um, as we move to our next session, but I'd like to move next to uh, Deirdre Green, who received her um, MS in Occupational and Environmental Health in 2014. Hi, Deirdre. I do have to remind our speakers that they have to unmute themselves. <laughs> Sorry, yes, it said that I wasn't allowed to for some reason. But. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Deirdre Green. I graduated from the University of Iowa in 2014 with my master's in industrial hygiene. Um, since then, I, oh, well, currently I'm a health scientist at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, referred to as OSHA, which is housed in the Department of Labor, which is why I have this background here today. 
Um, after I left Iowa, I actually went on to get a, a doctorate in public health as well. So I have a um, PhD in epidemiology and occupational health. And I have used that entire experience in my current position. So um, I have a bachelor's in occupational safety. And so working for um, OSHA has allowed me to use my experience, um, all of my degrees and all of my experiences in the daily work that we do. So it's typically, I'm in the directorate of standards and guidance. So we are responsible for writing all of the rules and regulations that come out of the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So having a background in all things occupational health has been really helpful in understanding what uh, goes behind the rules and as well as helping protect the American workers. Wow, fantastic. Um, so after Iowa, you went on to get your PhD. Where did you do that? I went to University of Minnesota. Wonderful, excellent, good. Okay, um, our next panelist is Allison Nailway, who received her MS in 1997 and then her PhD in 2000, both in epidemiology. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. Yeah, um, so after I finished up my PhD work at Iowa, I went on and did a postdoctoral fellowship up at the Marshall Clinic in Wisconsin. And I had been working mostly in asthma and, and allergy and farm kids at Iowa and Marshfield had recruited me to do to continue on with that research. Um, however, when I got up there, I was mentored by a former epidemic intelligence service um, officer and he kind of switched my career path to working in vaccine safety and effectiveness and infectious disease epi. Um, so I stayed at Marshfield until 2003 when I was actually recruited by Kaiser Permanente in Portland, Oregon to come out and lead their program in vaccine safety and effectiveness research. And I am shocked that I've been here now for 17 years um, doing this, this line of work here. Um, so I definitely took a very research focused track when I was in at Iowa. And I've continued to pursue and develop that as a research epidemiologist with Kaiser. Fantastic. Wow. Okay. Already I can see where, where our next session about COVID is going to go. This is going to be great. But we have two more alumni I'd like to uh, introduce. Sean O'Grady is, is our next panelist who received an MA in Hospital and Health Administration here at Iowa in 1993. Welcome, Sean. Almost sounds like the Stone Ages, uh, right? <laughs> Not young, at all. all these young alums go, went first. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. Uh, I received uh, my MA in Hospital and Health Administration before there was an H in the degree and before there was a College of Public Health. So uh, I have an interesting perspective on the evolution of our program and the college, all of which is extremely positive and it's only gotten better with time. Uh, but since I graduated from the program, uh, I have served in various health system roles, first starting off down in St. Louis at uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital awesome. and working my way to the uh, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which is now the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, and have been with North Shore University Health System uh, based in Evanston, Illinois, since uh, 14 years ago, uh, and worked in various uh, physician practice management roles, uh, hospital operations, and now serve as the system's chief operating officer. Uh, we are a system based in the suburbs of Chicago, about two and a half billion dollars in revenue uh, with over 17,000 employees. So um, it has been uh, quite a ride the past six months in uh, redeploying our health system to respond to COVID. Uh, but it has been extremely humbling and uh, inspiring to work with such a dedicated group of individuals uh, who have put themselves uh, first and foremost on the front lines for the people we're privileged to serve. So happy to be with you today and uh, talk more about our experiences. Excellent. Thank you very much. And our final panelist today is um, Wen Quan Wang, who received his PhD in biostatistics in 2003. Welcome, Wen Quan. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you for organizing this and uh, inviting me. I'm happy, happy uh, here. Um, so I got my PhD uh, in biostat in 2003. After that, I went to uh, University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham uh, Comprehensive uh, Cancer Center as a, an assistant uh, professor of there. Um, however, after four years, I thought uh, uh, I need to actually you know, apply my uh, biostat training in more applicable ways. So that's why I actually switched to industry. 
Um, so <laughs> since 2007, I have been in the pharmaceutical industry. And the uh, most uh, recent three years, I have been working uh, in Sanofi Pasteur uh, on vaccine development. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I appreciate uh, a lot, uh, you know, the trainings I received at uh, Iowa. Um, I received a lot of, you know, not just a theory, but also applications. Uh, uh, when I was there, uh, I actually worked for the uh, Biostat Consulting Center. Then later, uh, a few years uh, in uh, Department Department of uh, Epidemiology with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Safteros. And uh, yeah, those trainings uh, helped me tremendously. Uh, in my work. Um, so, thank you. Excellent. Wonderful. All right. Well, I mean, we can clearly see that though all of you, um, you know, started at Iowa, you, you really kind of reached re amazing places and, and are doing some really interesting work. And so next, um, I'd like to really delve into to some of the work that you're doing. Um, Perhaps the greatest understatement of 2020 is that COVID-19 has changed life for us all, right, in, in many different ways, both professionally and personally. Um, and so I'd like in, in this next session to kind of discuss how the pandemic has changed your work um, and that of your organization. Uh, clearly, some of you, you know, it, you're very directly involved with, with some of the work around COVID-19. Um, others, in, in different ways or, or with you know, different sectors and so on. Um, so I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about some of the work that you are doing and your organization is doing around COVID-19. We'll switch this up a little bit and, and change the order. Um, let's start with um, Wen Kwan. If you would tell us a little bit about your organization, its role in COVID-19 and some of the work that you are involved with currently. Right. Um... Yeah, as we know, this, uh, this year, this pandemic uh, happens in front of our eyes. Uh, I would never imagine that, uh, you know, like uh, when I had my uh, training in public health, because actually before I came to the United States, to Iowa, I, I studied at the University of, uh, I mean, no, uh, Shanghai Medical University. Um, so, you know, we learned a lot of those, like, you know, past like a pandemic or some of those infectious disease uh, impacted us so much, but uh, I would never imagine like, you know, this uh, COVID-19 here this year happening to us. Um, so uh, as some of you might know that actually Sanofi Pasteur uh, specialized in vaccine development. So currently our company is uh, developing two candidate uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, one is based on recombinant proteins and the other one is based on mRNA. Uh, the mRNA one uh, probably will be similar to what uh, Pfizer and uh, uh, Moderna uh, are developing. Um, <clears throat> so this pandemic has sent, uh, you know, for, for our colleagues here in Sanofi Pasteur right now, uh, most of our, our, our research and development, like you know, office-based uh, employees, are uh, all working from home since uh, early March. And, uh, and uh, yeah, this pandemic impacted us so much. Um, um, but even though, I, you know, like for our uh, site in Pennsylvania, um, our manufacturing workers and also the laboratory workers are still coming to the office or to the site, but we are not allowed to go to. Uh, you, you know, even if we want to bring some uh, personal item, then we have to go through uh, several layers of uh, approval to get to the site. Otherwise, we will not be allowed to, our badge will not work. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, our work is impacted in a way that uh, actually, you know, uh, used to be, uh, we have meetings, but then we have the hallway conversations, the coffee room, you know, conversations, and those were taken away. And now we have to schedule meetings after meetings after meetings. Uh, so 
So it's actually sometimes it's very difficult to find a open slot to, to conduct the meeting. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, as a, we are very collaborative, all our colleagues, we share resources and we you know, share our information and try to, try to get uh, one, hopefully at least one of our vaccine candidates to the market. So, you know, to help um, protect uh, the public from this uh, devastating disease. Excellent, very good. Okay, um, Sean, tell us a little bit about um, what's happening from your perspective on, on the health system and um, you personally, how your work has been affected. Great, so uh, we just re uh, reflected a few weeks ago that on March 12th, uh, that's the day the world changed fundamentally uh, for the health systems around the country. Uh, and it was just about six months ago we celebrated that anniversary. And it's so hard to believe because um, so much has happened uh, since that time and we've learned so much. Um, and so what I would say has changed fundamentally about my role is from that period between March and mid-June, we just did COVID almost exclusively within the health system as all other services were shut down. Um, and that was an incredibly uh, robust, challenging, and uh, at sometimes terrifying uh, period where we were learning on the fly with the intent all along to make sure that our patients were safe and that our team members were safe. Uh, and I'm proud to say that we never had a moment where we didn't have appropriate uh, PPE for our team members. Um, and that uh, was fundamental to our commitment to ensure they were safe. Uh, but since that time and when we were doing COVID all the time, we converted one of our five acute care hospitals into an, a COVID dedicated hospital. Um, and so 100% of the patients and team members there were caring for COVID patients. That was fundamental to our success in the safety and efficacy of the care we were providing. Uh, and at our peak, uh, we had uh, close to 200 patients hospitalized within our system. Uh, today, we have nine. So the world has changed a lot relative to the, uh, that time period and today. But the biggest challenge, quite honestly, after we got through understanding as much as we could about this disease was rebooting the health system to provide all the other services that had been shut down during this uh, period between March and June. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we find ourselves today in that we have to be a, self, a health system that does both uh, things effectively keeps our patients safe in every environment, whether they're COVID or non-COVID, but returns care to the community because we know people are going without services that are vital uh, to their immediate health, as well as more importantly, their preventive health. And I think many of the folks on the call will share the concern that we have that we're going to see the um, negative impact of COVID-19 for many years as we understand how many people did not receive care they needed at the appropriate time um, and that's something that, you know, uh, is very new for us in a, a society where we're used to that being uh, the fabric of what we do for the majority of Americans. Obviously, not everyone has that access, uh, but that is a big item that we are continuing to evolve, uh, as well as uh, integrating the uh, real challenges of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, that have faced us head on during this pandemic. So uh, I find that we are much more community connected as an organization. We were privileged to be the first in Illinois to have hospital-based testing because of the leading work of our pathology department. And uh, we've tested over 150,000 patients for COVID-19, uh, giving results within 24 hours. Uh, and if you think about how that compares to most of what's going on nationally, uh, I have immense pride uh, for the, the safe care and rapid care we've been able to provide our community. Uh, but it has come with its cost, a uh, significant financial impact to the health system, uh, needing to right size a workforce in response to some of those activities, uh, and most importantly, ensuring we're prepared for whatever might come uh, in our next chapter. So uh, I could talk forever, but that's not my job. So, uh, <laughs> but the way my job's changed significantly is uh, I would say that um, we are, have to adapt uh, on a much more rapid basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can and that's the exciting thing in organizations that typically have moved super slow and are resistant to change. Uh, we like that now and on a daily basis we're, we're doing that and that's been really invigorating. Fantastic, you bring up um, 
so many important points. I mean, I think one of the things you just said at the end of, about change and change management, um, we've all figured out we can do it, whether we like it or not. <laughs> so uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Allison, how about with you and, and Kaiser Permanente? Well, I can say that I am more busy professionally now than I have ever been before in my life. Um, I will talk about the research angle of things first, because that's largely what I do. Um, I had previously been working all of my career in tandem with the CDC, um, so that has just ramped up to an insane pace. Um, I got five new grants funded, COVID-related grants. Um, we're looking at COVID and healthcare personnel, first responders, essential workers, pregnant women, you name it. Um, we have studies going um, with all of those groups. Um, I've been helping our clinicians do clinical trials. So we did some of the early clinical trials on remdesivir use, um, mainly in ICU patients. We've also done one vaccine trial with Pfizer. We're starting another one through the NIH um, Coronavirus Vaccine Prevention Network. I think I got that acronym right. Um, and now I've been funded to do a lot of the vaccine safety work um, because the vaccine or vaccines are coming and they're coming faster than I think we ever would have anticipated. So we're shifting more now into doing what I've done most of my career, which is actually vaccine safety and effectiveness work. So I am I'm really exhausted. Um, I've been very busy. I always thought, yes, this is what I've trained for, um, being an epidemiologist in a pandemic. And it's just been a really exhausting experience. Um, also kind of a frustrating experience um, with trying to work with CDC and they've been hamstrung a lot in what they can and can't do right now. Um, we just published our first COVID related paper that came out um, looking at COVID and pregnant women that came out in the MMWR. Mm -hmm. um, that was a battle like I've never battled before to get a paper published. Um, so it's just, it's been really tough. And then in addition to my research role, I also serve an administrative role at in my institution. So we, I think Sean said March 12th, that was kind of our date too. Um, we transitioned our workforce of about 230 employees over to full-time remote work. And that left a lot of people who are doing behavioral and intervention trials and clinical trials in the lurch, like how are they gonna see these participants and bring them in? Um, so we had to set up all of those procedures and processes. Um, our health plan, Kaiser Permanente, rapidly shifted to um, virtual visits um, and all these electronic visits. So all different types of modalities of treatment that we've never really used before. Um, so we're trying to get some research going to assess how that has impacted care. Um, one of the studies that I've done, we've noticed that we've definitely had a decline in our childhood immunization rates um, with COVID. People just aren't bringing their kids in for those reaching in childhood immunizations. So we have a paper on that that we published. Um, and also our health plan is really going to be financially strapped um, moving forward in the future. And so they've actually made the decision to cut our um, non-labor costs as much as possible so they've actually put our building our office building on the market so we had to move <laughs> all of our people and all of our furniture out of that building completely and then if you can tell i'm demoralized we've also um had a lot of um civil unrest here in portland that's made the the news quite a bit and i think the most awful thing that's happened to us recently is the wildfires that we've had out here on the west coast um the one wildfire that was closest to Portland actually came within 10 miles of our hospital, one of our large hospitals that we own here. So we had to move all of the patients out of that hospital and move them into our second hospital facility. So that was just a very disruptive um, thing that happened. And we were trying to get all those patients shuffled across town and then ultimately brought back into our current hospital. And we had employees evacuated from their houses and, and losing their properties. Um, and just dealing with the very unhealthy air that we had here. 
So it's been a really rotten year. Um, <laughs> we've been very busy. Um, I'm glad that I'm able to play some small part in it um, as an epidemiologist and, and hopefully the vaccine work that I'm doing right now will, will hopefully help get us out of this pandemic. Excellent. You bring up many, many important points. I think one of the really important ones also is we're in the middle of a pandemic and so it is all encompassing and yet it's not the only thing that's going on. You, you bring up the wildfires and and um, the social unrest that we're seeing across the country. So those are things that, that all of you, I'm sure, are dealing with in, in one way or the other as well. Um, the other point that um, I'm going to come back to is, is about how you're doing personally. I think that is, is incredibly important as professionals in public health. Um, so we're gonna come back to that. Uh, but first, I want to give uh, Deirdre um, the opportunity next to talk about what you're doing, what your organization, what is, what is OSHA involved with, um, and how has your work been impacted by COVID? Yeah. Um, so my kind of path getting to OSHA was pretty recent. I actually left the CDC in January and joined OSHA in January, so quite <laughs> right before everything started. So for me personally, uh, my work didn't shift too much because I was one of the first uh, members of the agency that was on our COVID response team. So oh. I have been doing COVID response for the agency essentially since my first month um, <laughs> joining. So it, it's, I don't, it's not what was described during the job interview process, um, so, <laughs> but it's definitely been uh, rewarding. I, so the agency um, obviously has done the best that they can to respond to the pandemic. Um, we partner very closely with the CDC and pretty much all federal agencies as far as our response to the pandemic, um, definitely in putting out guidance. And that's been pretty much the push that we've all been doing, um, kind of responding to and keeping track of the information that's out there from both private industry, um, academic institutions, and just following how the pandemic has been affecting Americans and then working to put out the most useful guidance for response. And so mm -hmm. initially that started off with like kind of over, you know, large over encompassing guidance documents that were meant to be applied to all industries. And as time has gone on really focusing on the different industries that are out there that are still having to work. So obviously healthcare was one of the first things that we tackled as far as thinking about what things would be most useful for that industry. And then also all essential industries and critical infrastructure um, all those people who have to still go to work every single day. So that has been the largest push, at least that I can talk about from our agency as far as what we've been doing. Um, I'm not on the enforcement side at all. Again, I'm in the Directorate of Standards and Guidance. So our response is fully based on writing any rules or helpful things that could you know, come out there to help um, with response. Um, but yeah, that's been that's been like what our agency has been most focused on in our directorate in particular, um, and that's really taken a lot of time. <laughs> um, it's definitely you know I I moved to like I said I moved to Washington D.C. in January, so this has been quite different than the CDC and also just the city. This is a very yeah. political city, and yeah. everything that we do is I work right next to the Capitol building, and it's just very interesting um, how the whole city has moved. Um, it shut down, uh, I would say, and well, not formally, I'd say things slowed down around March, just like everyone else mentioned. I think we all were sent home. It was after St. Patrick's Day, so maybe around March 7, 17th, 18th. Yeah. Um, and since then, uh, pretty much all federal agencies have been working from home. Um, the senior executive staff, so the highest levels of management, they have gone back to the buildings, um, but they have been um, all the buildings have been following different protocols, but mostly in line with whatever their safety teams have come up with. So yeah. that's also been something um, because of my experience at Iowa, my industrial hygiene background, they've um, actually, I'm the OSHA uh, representative on our entire DOL facility reopening plan. So um, I've been kind of giving the occupational safety and health aspect and expertise on how we should proceed with reopening our facilities, especially because yeah, I'm sure everyone has experienced this. Um, some of our facilities are easy to kind of manage. You know, it's one building and most people can work from home, but then there's a lot of regional offices and a lot of people who are responsible for going into work sites and evaluating them and kind of responding 
face to face with people. So just kind of taking all that into account and responding the best that we can. Yeah, wonderful. Standards and guidance. That's what we need. And that's what we've been looking toward, right? I mean, as, as in our college, at our university, but then as, as you um, indicated, there are workplaces all over the country and, and a lot of people that have to go back into the office and, and how do they do that and how can they feel comfortable and confident in doing that. So thank you very much. That was a great description. All right, Taylor, how about um, from, from the perspective of local public health? So tell us about what you're doing, how your work has shifted during this pandemic. Yeah, so my situation is kind of similar in that I actually started my position in January as well. <laughs> so I really was only doing my focus work, my community work, um, mental health and substance use until about March when I was also activated. Um, and uh, as a COVID responder uh, through the county, uh, which a lot has definitely changed. Um, the county, uh, you know, when we have these emergencies uh, uh, develops or, or activates their incident command structure and this whole, you know, a lot of roles get changed. So mine definitely uh, <laughs> switched over. Um, because of my kind of varied background, I was moved over to the EPI and surveillance team. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually started out um, once I was activated doing um, white paper summaries on um, latest research of COVID ranging from seroprevalence studies to uh, how to communicate about, you know, prevention efforts and um, just all kinds of things. Um, eventually that did transition over to um, uh, cluster analysis. <laughs> so and that's what I'm doing right now is um, through the, so through the county, we get um, case data. So we get line list data uh, and we get that from the state and local, you know, health agencies. Uh, and so part of our work at the county is to be able to make sure that if there's spread going on, we, we try to intervene and, you know, prevent that from spreading further. Uh, and also just to have the statistics on hand to know what we're working with. And so uh, my role in that is when we get line list data that's cleaned and um, we have, you know, a whole team that works on it. Um, when it gets to me, I go through the line list and um, determine if we see any cases connected, if there's, um, you know, if whether it's households, whether it has to do with a certain location, a certain event or something, um, and track that so that our teams can know where to intervene, you know, what's going on and things like that. Um, I also track exposure. So if there's exposure um, going on, so since we have schools, <laughs> you know, starting and everything, if, or um, other locations, uh, I track that to make sure that we're catching what, what we can. Um, and that's just one small part. We have a, 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 bunch, of, uh, a bunch of awesome team members uh, that work on that. And we kind of, yeah, put out that data daily. So mm -hmm. they keep us hopping. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Boy, the, the five of you have, have hit so many different aspects. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second to let our um, audience know that um, we are going to be shifting to question and answers. So I do encourage you that you can submit questions um, using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, we definitely want to have, have our attendees to this webinar interact with our panelists. So if you, um, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you want to say hi to one of your you know, fellow students <laughs> when you were here, um, please do that. Uh, and we're going to open up for questions in here in just a minute. While we're waiting um, for questions to come in, I did want to do kind of a lightning round uh, question just to see how you as individuals are doing. Um, it, it's a hard time, Allison, as, as you said, you know, I think we're all, we're, we're working from home or working from wherever we're, we can work, um, but it's overwhelming. I mean, it's busy, there's lots to do. How are you doing personally um, in this time? What is something that you're finding is giving you sort of um, some relaxation or, or something to you know, kind of stay focused on what you're doing? How about you, Sean? How are you doing and what is something you're doing to take care of yourself? So, uh... Early on in our 
uh, COVID response efforts, we had multiple huddles every day and uh, we ended every huddle uh, with a reflection uh, and, and a focus for people so that we had it continually in front of us about people's wellness uh, because this was incredibly traumatic uh, and everybody deals with trauma in different ways. Um, I would say that uh, from March through the beginning of July, um, I worked every single day of the, every single day, like most people probably on this call. Um, and that rhythm uh, was exhausting, but it was a rhythm. Um, I found when I stepped off for vacation in July, um, it was frankly really hard to come back uh, because the enormity of this not changing and it being with us and not being a you know one and done kind of situation really kind of took a toll on me and I had to refocus and recenter. Uh, I'm a person who's very active physically and that's how I get a lot of my stress relief. Uh, but I realized I had to have more focus on uh, spiritual and higher purpose uh, because um, this, the enormity of the decisions being made on a daily basis really caught up with me. So I think I'm still trying to find that balance, uh, but the mind-body connection in periods of stress uh, is something that is uh, really uh, profound. And as organizational leaders, um, we have the obligation to make sure people at the entire scope are taking care of themselves, but they first look to see if we're taking care of ourselves. Uh, so I have tried to uh, be, show by example, by taking vacations, by sharing my experiences with uh, spirituality and moving uh, physically, uh, and that's resulted in some good dialogue, but, but it's been really hard, to be frank, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think I've heard that from many of my colleagues on this call today. Absolutely. How about you, Wen Kwan? How are you doing on a personal level? Things that you're finding keep you going? Yeah, this is, uh, as uh, Sean just said, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very difficult time uh, this year, uh, you know, at the beginning, because uh, uh, like in March, uh, usually I have a long commute to office every day. So at the beginning, you know, I don't need to go to the office every day and that saved me some time uh, commuting. Uh, I said, oh, wow, this is nice. But after a few weeks uh, that caught up, like, you know, you don't see your colleagues in, you know, like in, in the office, you don't meet with people face to face. And uh, I think mentally that will take a toll. And uh, so, so yeah, um, so like, you know, our, um, my family, we, we try to set up a routines, like, you know, we have to have our dinner together so we can talk and, uh, you know, like that. And uh, usually, after each meal, we go for a walk in the neighborhood, even though like it, during the normal time in, in the neighborhood, you're walking, you know, people will you know, talk and uh, have a conversation. But now, like, you know, either myself or someone else you now in front of me, seeing me, you know, it's either myself taken to the other side or the, yeah. you know, the other side. Yeah. So, um, but, but I think the routine helps. Um, I think, but at the end, I think, you know, as Sean mentioned, I think the, the greater uh, aim or goal that helps us, uh, like in my work, I actually, um, you know, we want to develop vaccines to actually fight this uh, pandemic. I think that will actually keep us going. Excellent. Excellent. How about you, Taylor? How are you doing? What, what do you do to keep yourself going? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm making it, <laughs> uh, as we all are. Um, it's definitely a lot. Um, it, I mean, COVID and just the repercussions of everything weigh, weigh on all of us. So um, finding ways to kind of step away from that is important for me. So um, after the day, I try to, you know, um, definitely routine. I, I love the, <laughs> I love routine. That's, that's good. Um, I try to do other things like um, practicing you know, other recipes, going for walks, um, uh, definitely ha having or trying to find more of that work-life balance. Now that we're all home, it's, it's trickier. So trying to practice that as much as I can has been kind of my, kind of my rock there is <laughs> trying to find that balance. So yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, Deirdre, how about you? How are you doing? 
Um, I'm, this sounds a little different. I'm actually doing really well. <laughs> I had, <laughs> I am, I am so excited to move to um, Washington DC. It, it hasn't been exactly the year I had planned, but this has given me a chance to drive around without DC traffic um, and oh, yeah, kind of yeah. do some <laughs> short road trips to places. Um, you know, I'd never really kayaked before, or went hiking or anything like that. And so this has given me a chance to do all of those things. Um, my metro commute was close to like an hour each way. And so it's given me some of my time back to enjoy other things. Um, work definitely has its moments. I, 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 it was very hard in the beginning to hear about all the deaths from COVID and then also work on COVID all day and then get on social media and we're still talking about COVID and the news and you can't even go to the store without seeing masks so being reminded of COVID all the time, but um, I absolutely love my job. I love working for OSHA and I love the people that I work with. And so I think I found a little bit of comfort also in just knowing that if we've been able to save just one life from anything that we've put out there, um, it really helps me to know that we might be making a difference in at least some people's lives or some workplaces out there. Absolutely, thank you. And, and reminding us, there are some silver linings maybe really thin linings, but, but there are some silver linings um, in some of this as well. Excellent. And how about you, Allison? You mentioned earlier, you know, some of the sort of fatigue and, and frustration. Um, are there things that you're finding help you to, to stay focused or to stay energized? Yeah, I actually just quit all social media about a month ago. I, I couldn't take it anymore. It was it actually was like making my brain hurt. Um, so I just stopped because um, I had been kind of like, oh, I got to look at the counts every day. I've got to look at all this. And I just turned that off and I feel a lot more at peace now. Um, I also feel like I have some purpose in my job for sure in what I'm doing. Uh, I think it's very meaningful. Um, I know that we are helping save people's lives um, and, and we'll continue to do so. I mean, just I've seen our mortality rates drop um, since the beginning of this as we've gotten better at treating this uh, disease in our hospitals and ICUs. So, I mean, that I, you can see it in the data that that's happening. So we are getting better and we're improving our understanding. Um, I am blessed to live in a very beautiful region of the country when it's not burning. <laughs> um, so I have been going out to the beach a lot and just uh, it's about an hour and a half drive from here and just kind of taking some long beach walks and just letting the waves wash everything out of my brain and just be at peace for a few hours before coming back to work. Excellent. Good, good. All right, we are getting some questions in here. And so um, let's see, we have a few questions with regard to um, how do you think this pandemic is ultimately going to impact public health careers, sort of the, the future of public health careers, the outlook of, of public health careers? What do you see as, you know, either things that are coming from this that our students, young professionals should know about careers in the future? Anybody, whoever wants to start. So uh, I, I typed an answer to this, so I'll, I'll share it verbally. Um, you know, I think uh, there's important work to be done to objectively analyze what was done well in this pandemic and what was not done so well. Uh, and uh, we need to do that from a scientific perspective. The greatest tragedy of this pandemic has been the attack on science. Um, and we, as the people who lead our individual agencies and companies have to fight that. We have to fight that because when we lose that, we lose the fabric of what has made this a great country and a great scientific leader in the world. And so I share that because uh, depending upon the review of those results and who's in power will determine whether there's more or less investment in public health. Um, I am optimistic that there'll be more, but I'm not naive enough to believe that uh, isn't related to who is in power uh, and who decides what facts will see the light of day. Uh, and so I implore everybody on this call to make sure the facts see the light of day uh, because public health comes out on the good side of this if the facts come out. But if we allow others to grab the microphone and tell uh, untruths or fake news, 
uh, then we will not get the credibility and the expanded uh, impact that we all deserve as graduates of the College of Public Health. Excellent point, excellent point. Yes, the work that we do is science-based, it's evidence-based, um, and it makes a difference in everyday life. Absolutely. Anybody else, are you seeing um, changes in, in focus areas where you're working? I mean, we're still in the middle of it, so it's kind of hard to think about, you know, what what we might need. But as you're seeing this unfold, do you see that there are particular areas that we would want to train our students in or that, you know, students could really think about, you know, um, positioning themselves for for the future? I can I can add a little. <laughs> sure. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it, everything that has gone on has expanded what, um, you know, public health has been in, involved in or, you know, taken a part in. And um, I think that that's something that we'll continue seeing, see grow um, along with that, it, not just a one incident kind of situation. I think we're finding that along with just responding to this, we're also having to learn to maintain and that's, um, and just that kind of long-term sustainability of some of these emergency programs and what that'll look like. And so I think you're gonna see more, I, I mean, I, I foresee more, you know, um, in uh, emergency response, um, definitely, I mean, this is uh, what I'm, uh, <laughs> what I know, at least uh, like mental health and, you know, the long-term um, effects of, of trauma, just community-wide trauma in this, mm -hmm. um, and also um, uh, just response and surveillance to all of this. There's, there are so many things that um, I think we're going to continue to see uh, a need for. I know that at least um, at the county where I am, there's been, um, you know, uh, just the level of work and response that is needed has, has grown, and so we um you know uh had have to adapt to that and then learning how to continue that so i, I think there'll definitely be an expansion in um you know the public health career as a field overall it's just kind of um knowing where that'll go once we once we um reach that kind of plateau or um i don't i don't know if i can say resolution you know but um at some point yeah it'll be interesting to see where all of it goes well, good point. And as Sean um, talked about this a bit earlier as well, that, you know, as, as everything went into COVID response, um, a lot of other things were not happening because that's the way it had to be. Um, some of those things have shifted back. Similarly, you know, in local public health, some of those things have shifted back. But as we do a reflection on this and we look at, you know, what did we do well and what did we you know, where could we have done better or, or done things differently, we're going to see where there might be gaps or where there might be opportunities um, in all of your <laughs> kind of, in all of the, the different places where you are. So and that might lead to new things as well. Um, others, any other thoughts about, you know, new kinds of jobs or um, new areas that that maybe your organization would be interested in or could consider i can kind of answer that along with i think i've seen a couple more questions popping up about more jobs or like jobs in the future um, so i would i mean at least with the federal government ocean in particular we're always going to be responding to and addressing some sort of something going on there's always going to be some occupational hazard there's always going to be um, sadly, I'm guessing there'll be more infectious diseases in the future. And so as far as like hiring, I think having like a, you know, any kind of almost any side of public health, we would probably welcome that at the agency. Um, even this summer alone, we've hired about six people in my directorate by itself. And that would be, we've hired industrial hygienists, epidemiologists, physical scientists, um, people with you know, expertise in infectious diseases, aerosol science. I think um, it's 
having that wide range of knowledge is actually somewhat helpful and it could be and that could help place you in so many different jobs and also while learning new things so if someone has an interest in occupational health i think that we'll definitely be in that position to continue responding to this pandemic and then also any future physical or biological hazards in the workplace that's something that we're going to continue to respond to and that's still going to be out there and available excellent I want to shift just a little bit. We've, we are getting um, several questions in, um, sounds like perhaps from students, um, certainly from, from young people who are thinking about, you know, what kinds of jobs they would look for, how they would go about doing that. You all have, have achieved, you know, um, a lot of success in your careers to date. Um, what advice would you give to those young people that are, are looking to enter the public health field, you know, maybe later this year, maybe within the next year or so, how can they position themselves um, to, to get really good, interesting opportunities? Whether it's in COVID or just broadly, it can be broadly also. Yes, yeah, so I have a senior in the Tippy uh, College of Business who's graduating, and I will share the advice I've shared with her, uh, be patient. Uh, this is a really, really difficult time uh, to be coming out of school and entering the job market, uh, but no one should see it as dismal. When we get through the worst part of this pandemic, I believe our economy will rebound quickly, um, but just be patient. Uh, it's not about you. It's really not about you. Organizations are being very cautious with how they spend money. They're holding back on hiring. People are doing multiple jobs just because we're so unsure. So my empathy is with you, uh, but uh, you know, keep yourself busy, find things to do, uh, and 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 be be really patient would be my primary advice. I would say Very try important. to, and I would to kind of mirror that. I'd also say be open to different types of fellowships. Um, when I first graduated, I did an ORISE fellowship. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with ORISE or O R A U. Um, that's how I got my foot in the door with the CDC. Um, I think Allison mentioned it earlier. EIS is a good program for people who are finishing up their PhD, another way to kind of get some experience in the federal government. And then um, when you're applying on the USA Jobs website, really looking at those positions that are for recent graduates, um, the USA Jobs and the applications can be kind of difficult to get through and it, it can be kind of hard to understand, but recent graduate positions are specifically held for people who have graduated within the last two years. So they're looking for people to come in who are fresh out of school to provide them that additional training. Um, and that, that's what their, their goal is. So like people who have had 10 years of experience aren't going to necessarily qualify for that. Those are positions that are held for people, again, coming right out of school. Excellent point. And, and Deirdre, thank you for mentioning this. And Allison, you did say that earlier as well. There are a lot of internship, fellowship um, kinds of things out there at many of these national organizations that, um, that look at public health, whether that's you know, through CDC, they have a public health associates program. And, and it doesn't need to be for somebody who you know, is in public health currently, and their wide range, EIS certainly, um, CSTE, so on and so forth. It sort of goes on and on. Those opportunities are out there. The other thing, um, going back to this idea of we're doing things differently now, um, there are a lot of organizations out there that are doing internships virtually. Um, and so they were not able to do that in the spring. You know, they were just trying to, trying to get their, the work in front of them done. But over the summer and now into the fall, um, at the college, we're seeing more and more of our partners who are like, yeah, we can, we can do things with students. Um, it's going to look different than it did before, but, but there are opportunities out there. So that is an excellent point um, as well. Right. Yeah, actually, uh, for, for us, actually, at Santa Fe Pastor, uh, during the past summer, um, we did have uh, six uh, students doing internship in our uh, department. Um, even though uh, a lot of other, you know, their peers actually got the internships canceled and all that, but we discussed and we decided to to, to keep the internships uh, going. And uh, actually, you know, uh, we uh, those uh, six interns did great job. And uh, I mean, you know, we, we did have some uh, uh, studies done actually during the summer. 
point. Oh yes. yeah, be patient and uh, and looking for you know different uh, opportunities. Yeah, I, I also think that uh, graduates should be encouraged that health systems will employ more people with a public health background after we get through this uh, difficult period. Allison works for a system that's uh, been well ahead of the rest of the country in looking at population health and community partnerships. Uh, but I can tell you all of my colleagues are talking about what does the future look like in a health system? How do we stay more connected with the community? How do we uh, decrease disparities in health delivery? Conversations that have been really almost non-existent for the last two decades. So um, again, it's going to take some time, but I really think that those who are prepared in the professions within public health uh, have a bright future after we get through this, this difficult bump in the road. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Actually, uh, last month, uh, not last month, earlier this month, actually in September, uh, some of you might notice that uh, uh, nine or ten of the, the, the uh, uh, pioneering uh, manufacturers on COVID-19 uh, companies pledged together that, uh, you know, we want to develop the vaccine based on science. And I think, you know, for our fellow students, uh, once you prepared, I think science at the end will prevail. Absolutely. Wonderful. And Taylor had brought up also um, earlier the, the idea of sort of the importance of interdisciplinary work um, and, you know, cross-sector work as well. And, and so, um, it, it, public health is not just in the public health department or not just in the hospital or not just at CDC. There are many organizations and there are many partners that are involved. And so I think um, be patient and, and think broadly, um, think creatively as, as well. Wonderful. Well, we are coming um, to the end of our um, hour. And so any, any final quick thoughts that any of our panelists want to share um, before we wrap up? I like to talk. So um, I, mentioned <laughs> at the, I mentioned at the beginning that I was a part of uh, the Iowa family before the College of Public Health. And I hope everyone on this call uh, uh, understands the significance of the interdisciplinary conversation that you got to see today. Uh, that's what makes a College of Public Health a rich and vibrant community. And I can't tell you how proud I am uh, to sit with my colleagues today uh, because we had public health interaction in the program way back when, uh, but it isn't the way that it is today. And there's such richness if we can figure out how to pull these parts together. Uh, so I couldn't be more excited about uh, Iowa and uh, what we've done and what we will do. So thanks, thanks for the time. Well, thank you. That, that is wonderful. Um, I do want to be um, sensitive to, to the fact that we're coming to the end of our hour. Um, so I'd like to thank um, all of the audience members who joined us here today and a very special thank you to our alumni panelists for giving us a view into different types of public health careers, particularly uh, during this extraordinary time. We really appreciate you sharing your journey with us and, and the work that you do. Um, the College of Public Health would also like to invite everyone to stay connected with what is happening at the college by following us on social media. We're, we are active on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you all very much uh, for attending and thank you again to our panelists. We appreciate you uh, coming back during homecoming week to join us virtually. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.